Well, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. As you know, we're looking at a series called Our Very Own Slash Father God. Not the Godfather. I thought we'd have to change that a little bit. And I think this is number three. So if you remember, we left off last time with our highlighting that by Jesus saying, don't be afraid, that it wasn't intended as a disciplinary, disciplinary, disciplinary word or act. This is just the confirmation. Jesus was just giving them the confirmation of who I am. Don't be afraid. And then the second question that we posed to you was, why would Jesus send out 70 of his disciples with his authority if he didn't want for us to see the authority that he has given to his new creation, the church? So hopefully, we're beginning to see something here taking shape in the ministry of Jesus, and that it was this one thing. And that one thing was the revealing of the heart of the Father. That's what he came to do. So we see on the Mount of Transfiguration that Jesus said, don't be afraid. Jesus was just giving them confirmation and again of who I am. So as we see the beginning of the ministry of Jesus taking shape, and as we said last time, that it was to reveal the Father or the heart of the Father. So if then the Old Testament prophets and legalists were right, fear must be part of an integral part of his message, which is the message of Jesus. And in the way that we have presented it today is that it is, in short, by way of a fearful rendering in the way that we generally introduce the Father to people. It's like when you were in grade school. How many of you remember that? When you were in grade school and your best buddy or buddy yet would speak to you about how awesome and frightening their father was. So that on the day that you met your buddy or buddy at father, you were shaking in your boots. Now this is how some Christians introduce non-believers to the father. As we have said before, take note, it really takes time to get to know someone intimately and personally so that you can confidently express to others their character and their nature. And so it is no difference in knowing and presenting the Father to those who are strangers to the concept of him. Usually, if we're not trained and skilled in the introduction of others to others, so as to correctly present and identify their character and nature, we usually end up doing them a great disservice. We usually find initially that we make the mistake of putting the fear of God into people rather than his love for them. Why then is it so important that we don't do that? We ask this question because what does fear do? Fear binds. And fear keeps people giving. People go to church and in the fear of God they keep giving. <coughs> right? They keep giving. So, and if we keep fear in our messages, guess what happens? They become afraid that if they don't give, they become afraid of what will happen if they don't submit. And all the time, 
we are forgetting what God has to say about sacrificial giving. This is why I sent it to Isaiah. So what does God prefer more than sacrifice? Well, let's find out. Let's go to Isaiah or Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea? Hosea, yes, yeah, 6.6. 6. Now, some of, the, some of the verses today are from the Passion Bible and some are from the Amplified Bible. And I chose, I believe, what spoke truly about the nature of God as to which as to which translation I used so anyway this is from the Passion Bible it says for I desire and delight in dutiful steadfast love and goodness not sacrifice and the knowledge of an acquaintance with God more than burnt offerings now he's talking about you and I of course there but there is still in the heart of man a fear of God and the need to make sacrifice. But the most important thing that we need to know and to understand right up front is that God doesn't desire the blood, the blood sacrifice of animals or any personal sacrifices made by ourselves. So, let us now move to the New Testament. Let's take a look at Hebrews. We're going to go to chapter 8. Sorry, we're going to go to chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 18. That's quite a few verses. We'll find these verses of Scripture do away with and nullify the need for personal sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf was made by Jesus Christ himself. So starting then with Hebrews 10 at verse 8, we find, first he said, multiple burnt offerings and sin offerings cannot satisfy your justice, even though the law requires them to be offered. And then he said, God, I will be the one to go and do your will. So by being the sacrifice that removes sin, he abolishes animal sacrifice and replaces the entire, the entire system with a new covenant. Verse 10. By God's will, we have been purified and made holy once and for all through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Amen. Yet every day, priests still serve ritually offering the same sacrifice again and again, sacrifices that can never take away sin's guilt. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered the one supreme sacrifice for all sin, for all time, he sat down on a throne at the right hand of God, waiting, waiting until his Whispering enemies, the serpent, waiting until his whispering enemies are subdued and turned into his footstool. You know what? Helen always used to say, because I, I would bring her home from India when I visited India, I would bring her home a purse that was made from the skin of cobras. And she said, hon, I'd rather have a pair of boots because then he's under my feet. <laughs> anyway, verse, verse 14. The Holy Spirit confirms this to us by this scripture. For the Lord says, in verse 16, Afterwards, I will give them this covenant. I will embed my laws into their hearts and fasten 
my word to their thoughts. And then he says, I will not even, I will not ever again remember their sins and lawless deeds. So if our sins have been forgiven and forgotten, why should we ever need to offer another sacrifice for sin separation? Why? Because there's an inner emptiness and still a great sense of unworthiness that prohibits man without his knowing the grace of God and without the working and the leading of the Holy Spirit in preparing man's spirit, that without this working of the Holy Spirit, there's still an inability for self-forgiveness. Now, I remember a time in my own life that was born out of my own sense of unworthiness, brought about by an inability within me to receive. This inability of receiving blocked or blocks us from being able to freely receive with gay abandonment and delight. I think I told you about the watch, did I not? Just to remind you then, we were at the, uh, at the Bible, uh, uh, Bible school, and a man who i just come to know maybe by six months, he was a jeweler, and he wore this beautiful watch, gold watch. And I just said to him, oh, that's a beautiful watch, remember? And to my utter despair, he gave it to me. I said, no, 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 no. I'm just saying you have a nice watch. It's yours. But I had the greatest difficulty in receiving. So the pastor said to me, your inability to receive is rooted in your sin consciousness. So you must learn to freely receive and freely give. So this inability that I had inhibited me from seeing my Heavenly Father and more importantly, His forgiveness and the restoration of all of mankind through Jesus Christ on the cross. Oh, I could read it and I could read it out loud but it wasn't in my heart because I had unforgiveness, self-unforgiveness. So we're inhibited by self-demeaning thoughts. And until our minds are renewed by the washing of the word, Titus 3, 5, we're going to go there. This then is one of the verses of scripture, one of the verses of scripture that talks about our need of renewing our minds. And this is what I needed to do, of course, when I had received this watch. I needed to renew my mind to the washing of the word or by the washing of the word. So it says in verse 5, he saved us. Christ saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but because of his own pity and mercy by the cleansing bath of the new birth or regeneration and renewing of the mind or renewing of the Holy Spirit, Amplified Bible. And then, of course, we have Romans 12, 2, which instructs us to renew our minds by being transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. To change your mind, listen, is the central theme of Jesus' first sermon in Matthew 4.17. Here, Jesus challenged the people to change their thinking. Because regardless of how many times you read through the Bible, body of Christ, if your mind doesn't change, 
you're simply, you will simply, now catch this body of Christ, because many have done this and are doing it now. You'll simply impose your bias and your labels on the words you read. Okay, so Matthew 4.17 reads, From that time, Jesus began to preach, crying out, Repent! Change your mind for the better. Heartily amend your ways with abhorrence for your past sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, Amplified Bible. There is, let me say this, there is one troubling passage you'll find, and it is in Luke 12, 5. And I want us to dissect this verse. It's Luke 5. Uh, 12, 5. Luke 12, 5. Now this verse talks about fearing him who is able to cast you into hell. Now, how do we deal with that? If we understand the God, the Father, that Jesus presents to us, then how do we deal with this verse? Has anybody thought that to themselves? That's a strange thing for Jesus to say. Anybody thought that or just me? A lot of Christians down that road are going to be in the white throne or the mercy seat. That's right. Because this is one of the only time, this is the only time that Jesus tells us to fear anything. This one verse, listen, over the centuries has been used to talk about Father God. And they've even capitalized the hymn in this verse. Now let's read it. The one you must fear, the one you must fear is God, for he has both the power to take your life and the authority to cast your soul into hell. Yes, the only one you need to fear is God. <laughs> Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. All right. For us then to understand him in this passage, we need, first of all, to note that in the Greek, in the Greek, the word used for him is not a proper noun. A noun, as we know, is used to describe a person, a man or a woman, a place, home or office, or a thing, a table, or a banana. And it's the Greek word ha, H-A which is a masculine noun, but not a proper noun. So, fear him, lowercase, not uppercase, automatically takes this out of the realm of the Father. Are you with me so far? So listen, please don't throw eggs at me when I say this. But we need to understand that 100% of the time that Jesus uses the word hell in the Gospels, the Greek word Gehenna is used. Right? Everybody with me? And the 100% of that refers, listen, to an actual literal valley where they burn their garbage and their dead bodies. Do you ever thought about that? If everybody was buried in a rock, in a tomb, they would run out of rock. <laughs> so if you weren't wealthy, guess what happened to you? You were taken to the garbage dump and your body was burnt. Hallelujah. Now, it didn't come to mean hell until recent years. So in its proper context in this verse, Jesus is saying that he had seen the place 
And you need to be careful that they don't throw your body there when you're dead, when you die. What then does that come to mean? Question. What happened in 70 AD? That's right. Jerusalem was ransacked and destroyed. Second question. What happens leading up to that? Or what happened leading up to that? The Roman guard, that's the Roman soldiers, were ever pursuing Christians and Jews in trying to kill them. So what Jesus is saying here, in essence and in truth, he's saying, be on your guard, watch your back. There are and will be people out there coming to get you for the work I've asked you to do for me. Be on your guard. So in this verse, Luke 12, 5, it isn't talking about being afraid of God or the devil. It's all about being watchful against the one who can sneak up behind you and kill you and throw your body into the valley so that no one ever knows what's happened to you. Jesus is being concerned about the well-being of his followers, his disciples. That's all that there is in there in Luke 12, 5. Now, we also need to understand even as the Apostle John uses the book of Samuel in the Old Testament, telling us that the Lord does not take life. Does that marry up with what we just read in Luke 12, 5? In Luke, sorry, in 2 Samuel 14, 14, the Lord tells us that it does not take life. So in using that in a context or in context, we can understand that this isn't who Jesus is talking about in Luke 12, 5. It's who man is talking about. So Samuel 14, 14 reads, if you want to go there, Samuel 14, 14. Uh, second Samuel, sorry, yes. In the 14th chapter of the 14th verse of 2 Samuel, it reads, We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. And God does not take away life, but devises means so that he who is banished may not be an utter outcast from him. So using this then in the context of Luke 12, 5, this, is, this certainly isn't who Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about the Father. So if in that verse of Scripture in your Bible, in Luke 12, 5, you have a capital H for him, then cross it out and put a lowercase h, and in parentheses, Right, Rome, man. And next to hell, in that verse, write the valley of Hinnom, Hinnom, H-I-N-N-O-M. For it was there that they burnt their garbage at the garbage dump. And that's where they dumped all the dead bodies to be burned. G. Ben Hinnom, usually Gehina in English or Genhinin in Arabic and Hebrew. Isn't that interesting? Now, moving on from there, 
we need to look beyond the cross. Because surely after humanity had executed the Son of God, retribution should be in order. So we're going to do away with another myth. And now, because Jesus is dead, now he's dead, being falsely accused and crucified, he can send an angel an angel to lay to, uh, lay to waste all these people who persecuted him. But now look with me, if you will, at Matthew 28, 5. This is a well-known verse of scripture, of course, for those who study their words, study their Bibles. Matthew 28, 5. The women were breathless and terrified. Until the angels said to them, there is no reason to be afraid. I know you're looking here for Jesus who was crucified. Now you'll notice that the angel doesn't say to the women, go hide somewhere. Because he has arisen and he's ticked off. We all know that he had the right being wrongfully accused. But seeing that the angels aren't God, in John 20, 19, it tells us, now we moved on from the tomb, now we're in the upper room, from the tomb to the upper room. Again, that evening, the disciples gathered together, John 20, 19. And because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, they had locked the doors and the windows. But suddenly Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace to you, or shalom. Now, remember last week, I think it was, we talked about Jesus walking on the water. And how that, the storm, the boat was being filled with water. But Jesus was in the spirit realm, walking towards them on the boat, remember? So he was crossing, he was crossing the two realms, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. That is how Jesus appeared in the upper room. He crossed over from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. And he said to them, Peace to you, or shalom. And the word peace, or shalom, means that you don't have to fear anything. You do not have to fear, not just mortality, you don't have to fear death anymore, you don't have to fear mortality, and you don't have to fear God. In fact, you don't need to fear anything anymore. For I am with you to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. How about turning there? Let's read these two verses. See, what we need to understand by the Christ, if we're ever going to do the things that we have been called to do, to do greater things than Jesus did, greater things than these shall you do because I go to be with my Father, if we're going to do them, we have to understand these two worlds, the physical world and the spiritual world. And we have the ability, just like Jesus, to take from the spiritual world and bring it into the natural world, the things that Jesus did. But greater things than these shall you do because I go to be with my Father. Now in Matthew 28, 18 and 20 we read, then Jesus came close to them and said, All authority of the universe, heaven and earth, has been given to me. Now, when? Tomorrow? 2030? No. Now, wherever you go, 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget, I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Now, body of Christ, this is the risen Christ. And he appears with the message, peace be with you. When you take a look at this, it shapes up pretty amazingly. From pre-birth to post-death, what then is the message of Christ? It's don't be afraid. There is no need to fear anymore. There's no need to fear your light in life. And now the day is dawning in their lives, in your lives, when they'll realize and we will realize that we don't have to fear God. Jesus is saying to them, to the disciples, you don't have to fear me or what's happening. So let's now look at the definition of peace in the Greek. Ready? Remembering firstly that it is one of the first fruits of the Spirit. And then Jesus said that this is what he had come to give. Peace. Remember he said, my peace I give unto you in John 14, 27. But listen to this. Hallelujah. In John 14, 27. I like this. I like this in the Passion Bible. I leave you the gift of peace. Or I leave the gift of peace with you. My peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. How does the word, or how does the world, I should say, how does the world get peace? By placing upon it a requirement. You have to do this first. The world tells you, I can only give you this, I can only give this to you if you accept it. Now listen very carefully. But the way that the Father and the Son gives us peace is to insert it into you and I. And at no cost to us. So when Jesus says, I give you peace, then you have it. When you look up peace in the Greek, the first definition is national tranquility. An exemption from the havoc and the ravages of war. But every time we see some Middle East crisis, you'll find the doomsayers saying, this is it. This is the book of Revelation coming to pass. If that be the case, then show me in the book of Revelation where it says for us to be looking to the east for the end. And if you can find it saying by looking to the east for the end, then what about those people who live in the east? They would have to look west or really far east. And yet this is what happens. We say there's a crisis going on in the Middle East. Revelation must be coming to pass. Then we start looking around for bugs the size of helicopters. Now I say that because when Helen and I first went into the church, we went into a denominational church, and the pastor, who really, forgive me, had no concept of the Holy Spirit or the Word 
he said that that pit that opens up and all the locusts that come out of it, they're helicopters, they're gunships. Yeah. Have you heard that before? So <laughs> we start looking around for boats that are as big as helicopters. And that of a woman riding on the back of a seven-headed beast. Doesn't that sound ludicrous? Because that's not what it's all about. Second definition in the Greek for the word peace is that of a peace between individuals. Harmony or concord. Now let's remember that Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, which means security, safety, prosperity, and facility. So those of you who are having difficulty Difficulty of getting a job or don't have a job or have a job you don't like or hate. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. And prosperity is included in that. Now understand me when I say this, that it doesn't include greed. Doesn't include greed. Turn with me to Philippians 4.19. Because with the next definition, well, let me read Philippians 4.19 first. He said, I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have. For I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what you said this morning when you gave a word. Now, with the next definition of peace, we find that the Messiah's peace leads to the way, it leads the way to peace. And our Christianity tells us of a tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing to get back to Luke, so fearing nothing from God, the recipient is content with their lot, whatever it is. That's the definition of blessed assurance. Fearing nothing from God. And that is exactly what Jesus has just said to the disciples the moment that he had risen from the dead, appearing to them in the upper room. He said, there is no need for you to fear anything anymore. The word anything here is a very big word because it doesn't mean just sometimes. It means to fear nothing. And then the final definition that we find in the Greek is that of a blessed state of an upright man or woman after death. Peace. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for this time spent together today in our continuing journey to discover and to glean all the truths contained within your word. We know, Father God, that it is your desire that we know everything about you and about the Christ and the Holy Spirit and more importantly, that we know about ourselves in you. So, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of wisdom teaching us today. And we pray, Father God, that nothing will be lost from your word in us today. That it will be sealed in our spirits that we may grow thereby. And we pray, give praise and thanks to you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So all of you out there, I pray that you receive something from the word today and you have nothing to fear. And we all stand in agreement here today that healing comes into your life and the spirit of God comes into your life and the spirit of Christ comes into your life and the spirit of peace comes into your life. Amen? Amen. And amen. So until the next time, the Lord God be with you, bless you and keep you and may he shine his face upon you, be gracious unto you and give you his peace. And as ever and always, I always say to walk with God, to talk with God, and to be with God every day of your life.
So until the next time, shalom, God bless you, and goodbye. And I know we're supposed to make our words be few,